We're so glad to be with you. We'll be with you through the rest of the camp meeting this weekend. I uh, hope sometime tomorrow you come by the table and visit with Karen and I. Uh, we'll be hanging out off and on over there. We have a couple of gifts for those of you who came in person. Those of you who are not here in person, well, you're going to have to go to our website. But those, these are free. So you come back, we have our two newest sharing magazines. One is on the sanctuary. We've been wanting to put that out. It talks about salvation in the sanctuary, the meaning of the sanctuary, what the sanctuary says about salvation and, the, and prophecy and your body. And it's just an amazing uh, magazine for witnessing. And the final events of prophecy was a DVD. It's a magazine now. We have those for you as long as they last. Uh, one per family, we hope. Just uh, meet us at the table a little later uh, or sometime tomorrow. And uh, I, we're just very thankful to be with you. It's been fun to, to visit and just have a wonderful spirit here at the camp meeting talking about how to live above the crowd. Amen. Last night we shared a little bit from the story of Zacchaeus climbing the tree of life and the way that you get taller. We're all, we're all stunted uh, because of sin. I had asked Tina today, I said, you weren't offended at all, were you? you know? <laughs> Tina, 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 you want to wave? Folks, <laughs> we've known Tina for years. But we're all stunted by sin. And we get taller by climbing the tree of life, which is the cross, taking up our cross and following Jesus. Amen? Amen. And tonight we're going to talk about persisting for his presence. And as I always do, I like to take a story in the Bible and uh, help elaborate on it. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the second chapter of Mark. Mark chapter 2, and this story can also be found in Luke and in Matthew. It's an amazing account that's going to be summarized in about 12 verses. And again he entered Capernaum, and after some days it was heard that he was in the house. And immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, no, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and were reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say arise and take up your bed and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he arose, he took up the bed, and he went out in the presence of them all. So they were all amazed. And they glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now there is an amazing fact. Now, the disciples were deeply impressed by this story. As I mentioned, the synoptic gospels all refer to it. It's something they could not forget. First point, uh, just to give you the background, Jesus did most of his ministry. He was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, but he ministered around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he would hang out frequently at the house of Simon Peter. Jesus did not have his own house. A certain scribe, we believe was Judas, once said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he says, foxes have their holes and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus didn't even have his own house. The only personal property of Christ that is mentioned in the Bible is his clothes that they took away at the crucifixion and they gambled for them. So he had to depend on the hospitality of others. In Bethlehem, he'd go to Bethany and stay with Lazarus and Martha. And when he was around Galilee, he stayed probably at the house of Simon Peter. On one occasion, it tells us that he came to the house after a preaching tour. Peter's mother was sick with a fever, and his mother-in-law, and Jesus healed her. And uh, she got up then and began to continue serving. 
So here, after he's gone through another one of his preaching tours around the coasts of Galilee and the cities there, sometimes the only way Jesus could escape the crowd was he'd tell the disciples, look, I need to borrow your boat. Once he said, take your boat and push it out so I could preach because they were pushing him right off into the water. Another time, he sent the crowd away there ready to make him king and uh, he had to actually walk on water to get away from the crowd. Frequently when, when Jesus healed someone, he did one of these astounding miracles where he would uh, like heal a, a man who was full of leprosy and he'd say, don't tell anybody. And you probably wonder, why did Jesus tell so many of them, don't tell anybody? It's not that he didn't want them to glorify God. He just knew that his principal work was preaching the word. The physical healing was very important, but it is secondary as our story is going to bring out. And if his healing created so much uh, commotion and so much uh, opposition from his enemies that he couldn't continue with his preaching, he didn't want them to advertise it, but they could never. I mean, how do you keep it to yourself when you go through a miracle like that? As soon as he told them, don't tell anybody, they went and told everybody. Maybe that's the key for getting Adventists to do evangelism, start preaching, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but did you know... Then they'll tell everybody. <laughs> now we tell them, tell everybody, they don't tell anybody. So, it says again, he entered Capernaum, and after some days they heard, the crowd, that he was in the house, house of Simon Peter, and immediately many gathered together. So there was no longer room to receive them. No, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Now, did Jesus preach the word because many were gathered? Or were many gathered because he preached the word? Or maybe both. Now, I, I kind of know how Jesus felt that when there were many gathered, you'd want to preach the word. You know the Apostle Paul. They would like arrest him. And as he's being drug up the steps of the temple, he told the guard, can I talk to the crowd? They are just got done trying to tear him limb from limb. But he said, let's not waste a good crowd. <laughs> Let me preach to them. Isn't that right? When you're an evangelist, oh, you just want to preach. It's all I can do to restrain myself when we're on the airplane about to take off and the flight attendant has the microphone. I say, when you're done, could I say a few words? <laughs> I just, I'm always, whenever there's a microphone, I want to say something. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope it's because I want to just glorify the Lord and uh, to bring people to Jesus, but the Lord knows my heart. I'm jealous sometimes. I see all these people come out, 40,000 to watch a baseball or a football game, and I wish they'd let me do the national anthem and say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh, yeah, I just, I want to preach when I see a crowd. And the funny thing is that I once lived in a cave because I couldn't stand to be around people. The Lord really changes you, doesn't he? So, and I think there was a crowd because he preached the word. When we first went to Sacramento, well, 25 years ago, Karen and I came from a church where we had 100 members, a little church, country church, a great deal, lovely people. And uh, Don Schneider talked about going and pastoring the central church in the capital of California. I thought, I don't know if I can do that. And here it was a very big church where Karen grew up. She was baptized there and we were married there uh, before she was baptized. No, married after you were baptized. Yeah, let's get that right. And, um, and unfortunately, sometimes these big city churches, as the city sprawl grows around them and all the families move out to the outskirts, it starts, to, the family stop attending, attendance started to drop. And I told the conference president, I said, I don't know if I've got the experience to handle a church like this. And uh, I, people said, he has no pastoral training. What are you putting him in a church like that with all these professionals? They're going to eat him alive. And Don Schneider said, they don't need a pastor. They need an evangelist. And I was an evangelist in Northern California as well as the little church. And so I talked to the youth pastor. And he said, Doug, let me give you some advice. A youth pastor was older than me. And he said, let me give you some advice. He says, I've been here, pastor. He had been there 16 years, youth pastor. 
So I've seen pastors come and go and they have all these programs and all these seminars and all these machines and methods and mechanics and campaigns to raise money. He said, in a city this size, if you just preach the word, they will come. And so I kind of took that. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open the Bible and I'm going to preach the word. And you know, the Lord blessed. It went from like 120 to 300, 400, 500. It just kept growing. And uh, finally, we realized when we got to, you know, over a thousand, we said, we're going to have to plant another church, which is how we ended up at Granite Bay. Granite Bay is a plant of Sacramento Central. And ultimately, you know, the plan was I would move out to Granite Bay. Pastor Chris Buttery, our associate, is now the senior pastor of Central. He's doing a great job. But the idea is just preach the word. The world is hungry for the word. <laughs> and everyone's wondering what the secret formula is to do evangelism in these last days. It has never changed. Jesus wants us to preach the word. There's power in the word. The proclamation of the word, the foolishness of preaching, it still changes hearts. I was at a, um, a national religious broadcaster's convention a couple of years ago in Orlando. And um, I, I, I'm on what they call the President's Council. We've been part of NRB. We, we do that to protect the freedom to broadcast. And so um, I was at this meeting and a gentleman came in and he's the pastor of the largest Christian church in the world. Used to be in South Korea. That's no longer true. Now the largest Christian church in the world and the fastest growing is in India, a Hindu country. And uh, the man's name is Dr. Satish Kumar. And so he walked in the room and everyone wanted to visit. He was sort of the guest speaker for the religious broadcasters. And he walks in, I see him, he sees me, and he stops and he stares at me. I thought, well, that was a very clear recognition. I thought, what did I do wrong? And sometimes people see me and they go, oh, there's that, you know, cult leader or something. I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and sometimes it's positive. And he, I went out and shook my, his hand. He said, Doug Batchelor, amazing facts. I said, I watch your programs. I said, well, praise the Lord. The next day he was preaching, and I thought, well, I'll come and listen. He's talking to this room full of evangelical uh, ministers and broadcasters. I know Danny's been to NRB and Moses. They know what I'm talking about. And um, during his sermon, he stops. He says, I see our brother, Pastor Bachelor, is here with amazing facts. I thought, oh, if you think that's going to help you in this crowd, it's probably not true. But he, anyway, he said that. And, and he said, um, he starts then talking about the second coming and the Sabbath. And he said, you know, there's 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, 2,000 years from Jesus to where we're living today. And then we spend 1,000 years Sabbath with the Lord. And everyone's going, hallelujah. Honest. So I went up to him afterward. I said, We've got a training school in India. If I go visit our school, we'd like to come see you. He said, well, I hope you do. So we did. We, we went to India to uh, meet with our uh, evangelism training school over there and, and um, went to visit Dr. Kumar. Church has 190,000 members. <laughs> and in the, uh, just on the outskirts of Hyderabad, India. And... Um, while we were there, he said, you know, um, maybe you'd like to share for us tonight. He said, of course, our services are in uh, Telugu, so we can't have you do the main services on Sunday, but we, we're having a, a Friday night prayer meeting. We do an all-night prayer meeting, and, and uh, maybe 10 o'clock tonight, you'd like to talk? He said, we'll probably have about 25 here. Now, I had just flown in to India. No, that's a long flight. And I thought, oh, you know, I love the Lord and I, I like the ability, I got to wake up early and preach and, the, and I'm supposed to preach at the conference that same day and, and I'm thinking about, and John Ross is there with us, he elbows me and he says, he's talking about 1,000. I said, what? He said, 25,000. <laughs> I said, I'll be there. <laughs> I told you about how I feel about a crowd. <laughs> We came that night, had, we, we spoke earlier that day at uh, the conference office, and then later that night we got there, heaven, they pray all night. Oh, they stayed till five in the morning because the people didn't have to go eat and go to work. Talk, talk about commitment. And he stays there with them all night. He's not like one of those pastors, you have an online prayer service, I'm going home. 
And so we got up and the men are sitting on one side. They seat 18,000 in the main room. And they, and he built that thing in like 52 days. How come it takes us so long in California? <laughs> and then they had another room with like 10,000 overflow. It would seat that. And he has five services on Sunday. Anyway, I'll tell you, it was pretty exciting to be able to get up and share with them. And I just shared my testimony. And uh, we stayed in touch. He just texted me a few days ago. We went to see their church on Sunday. And um, they gave us the, the VIP tour. And, and I thought, why is this church exploding? They're just, he stands up there, he opens the Bible, and he goes through the Bible, and he does expository preaching of the word. And the people there are hungering for it. And it's just exploding all over India. And he, he texted me not long ago. He said, please pray for me. We're getting opposition from the government and from other pastors because the church is growing so much. And so we have just been so excited to see the power of the word around the world. And um, I better not tell you that. <laughs> Another time, I will sometime. He preaches. Immediately many were gathered together. There was no longer room to receive them. No, not even near the door. I went on a uh, church building project with Maranatha and we built some, we built amazing facts and our team built 70 churches in India and, and we went to one church dedication where there were so many people the very day you dedicated the church that there was no room, you could barely breathe, it had no air conditioning and um, the doors were full of people staring in the doors, the windows, the windows were blocked with people staring in the windows. Uh, the people inside were all just totally squashed together. And when I stood up to preach that morning, I wasn't sure what I was going to say. And this sermon is what came to my mind because it was really that way. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, send those days again where people will hunger for the Word of God. Right now, there's so many distractions. Everyone's got their, their phone. People walking around, bumping into walls and getting run over because they can't stop texting. Having car wrecks or constantly everybody's watching some device or they're sitting at the computer. They don't talk to each other anymore. And I texted Karen from my office to her office. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have done that before? You, from one end of your house you text someone on the other. Come on, see, let me see the hands. Confess. <laughs> we need... We need to get back to preaching the Word, reading the Word, not even near the door. And then they came to him bringing a paralytic. Now, this man could not help himself. He's paralyzed. There's no way he can get to Jesus. If you read in the book Desire of Ages, his paralysis is directly connected with a personal sin. And the thing he's longing for more than anything is that he might hear the Lord say, you're forgiven. He just feels separated by God. And so many of the religious leaders back then, if you were suffering from some terrible malady, they said, well, you're being punished for your sins. This is something you deserve. You know, one time the disciples saw a man that was born blind. They said, Lord, how is it that he's born blind? Was it his sins or his parents? In other words, did God know he was going to sin so he's punishing him in advance? Or was it the sins of his parents? And, and so they used to think anybody suffering, they're getting what they deserve. And so he just always felt like he was so, uh, such an outcast and so isolated from his own people and so cut off. But he had some friends. And they said, we will bring you to the house where Jesus is preaching the word. It's good to have friends like that. Uh, I've not done the count myself, but I heard someone say once that nearly 50% of the people that were healed by Jesus were either brought to Jesus or someone interceded in their behalf. Amen. There's a lot of people that need forgiveness and they need healing and they're never going to get to Jesus without the help of others. Right. Now these four friends, that takes commitment. They got to carry him. They're not rolling him. You know, some of the most important uh, people in a war are called the stretcher bearers. And uh, I was very privileged to be friends with Desmond Doss. You know, his, uh, his second wife, Dorothy, 
was a member of our church in Northern California, so we'd see him periodically. And uh, just a wonderful man. He was famous because he put his life on the line so many times to carry people off the field of battle so they might be healed. And those are some of the most important people in a war. And you know, we're in a war in this world between good and evil, and God needs stretcher bearers that are not just going to care about getting themselves saved and healed, but caring about the others that are wounded around them. And so they committed to bring their friend to Jesus. I remember reading a story. I like doing amazing facts. This guy, Ivan Fredericks, they knew, he's better known as Russian Jack. He and a buddy were doing gold mining in Halls Creek, Western Australia. I don't know if you know where that is, but it is the end of the world. It is out, you know, by the great sandy desert. And I, I've been all the way out to Western Australia, Perth, Derby, Broome, these towns, to speak to a few aborigines that were watching our programs out there. And uh, it, boy, I tell you, you can drive and see a whole lot of nothing. I flew five hours and the, there was no clouds. I looked out the window. The landscape did not change in five hours. I had no idea it was so big. It was just red dirt. So these guys are out there gold mining. They ran out of food. They tried to shoot a kangaroo. And when one of them was going to fetch it, I've been Frederick's buddy, he slipped and broke his leg out in the middle of nowhere. So Ivan said, well, the nearest clinic is a hundred miles away and all he had was an old heavy wooden wheelbarrow they used for mining. He put his friend in the wheelbarrow and pushed him a hundred miles. Wow. That's a friend. <laughs> I don't know if I have any friends that are that good. But I, <laughs> can you imagine how tired your arms would be? And when he finally wheeled into the town there in Wyndham where there was a clinic and the people all came running out, they saw him coming down the road and, he, and he said, you just pushed him in a wheelbarrow a hundred miles from Halls Creek? He said, yep. And his friend in the wheelbarrow said, and he didn't miss a single rock on the way either. <laughs> That's a friend. So these friends brought their friend to Jesus. But there's a problem. The problem is the crowd, once again, was too tall. Now, wait a second. This is the crowd at the house where Jesus is preaching the Word. That's called the church. And they were keeping people from getting in because he's paralyzed. And I suppose as they brought their friends, by the way, I know what their names were, the four Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the ones who typically bring others to Jesus. Isn't that right? I just made that up, but there is a spiritual point there. <laughs> and um, so they get to the door, and they can't get in, they can't get anywhere near the door, and they maybe tap on someone's shoulder and say, we got a fellow who really needs to be in the presence of Jesus. And they said, we got here first. You, you know, first come, first serve. You snooze, you lose. <laughs> this is our place. You know, I actually know some people, members in our churches, I won't say what church, that they got their pew. <laughs> and if they get to church and some visitor has the audacity to sit in their spot, they will give them a piece of their mind and they'll say, how many of you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> and they'll say, uh, excuse me, that's our spot. And they'll go, I'm sorry, it's the first time here, I didn't know. All right, we'll let it go this time. <laughs> and so here they're trying to bring someone crippled to Jesus, and the crowd, hearing the word, won't let him in. So they can't get through the door. The crowd has no sympathy for this man who obviously needs it more than they do. So they try the window, one window, can't get in. They said, Stop pushing, we got here first. And, you know, it's a little harder when you're carrying a stretcher to bring your friend in. It takes a little more room. And they go to another window, and they do everything they can. They can't get anywhere near it. So the man in the stretcher, he says to his buddies, I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for trying. Maybe another day. And they said, not on your life. We carried you here. You're walking home. <laughs> they didn't give up. Can you say amen? Amen. There were plenty of obstacles, 
but they were going to make sure that they got their friend into the presence of Jesus. You know, that's where the miracles happen. Is if we can get people connected with the proclamation of the word, that's where our battle is. Now, the word does it. The Bible tells us that the word of God descends from heaven like the rain. It will not return void, but it will accomplish the thing that I've ordained. And if we can, you go around, you give people DVDs. Does anyone do that anymore? Some people, yeah. You, you give a DVD or you, now you have to give a link to somebody. You send them a link. But whatever you can do to get them to listen to the word or to watch the word. And there's power in that. And they said, well, it's not good enough that they bring their friend to the house where Jesus is preaching the word because houses don't save anybody. They needed to get their friend into the presence of Jesus preaching the word. Indeed, Jesus is the word incarnate. Yeah. Isn't that right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so they would not give up until they got him connected with the word. He had to be in the presence of Christ. And you know, all of us, ultimately, we need to come to Jesus and have a personal relationship. We all need a personal encounter to Jesus. It's amazing how many people were surrounding the house where Jesus was, but they didn't experience the miracle this man experienced because his friends persisted in getting him into the place where Jesus was. Now, we all have loved ones that we care about. We all have friends we'd like to see saved that maybe don't know the Lord. One of the most common questions that I get is what can I do to reach, most common thing is, my son, my daughter, my grandkids, my spouse, my friends, my work associates, family member. Doug, what can I do? And they think that maybe I've got some secret formula. It's three things. I learned this from C.D. Brooks, and uh, I never found a better answer. Three things you can do for the people that you want to reach. There's only three things, but they're very powerful things. Well, there's three and a half. One, if they're open, share information with them. Give them a, a book, a magazine. If they don't have a Bible, get them a Bible. Um, you know, find some way to give them a tape. I say, still say tapes. Does anyone have a tape player anymore? How many still have a cassette player? Look at that. I knew in this group I could ask that question. <laughs> and... Uh, so you, you give them, a, you know, a DVD or a magazine, something, give them the Word, and if they'll listen to the Word, or if they'll take a Bible study from you, give them a Bible study. Take them through the Amazing Facts Bible studies or something. So information, if they'll listen to information, that's one thing. Second thing is pray for them. Now some people think, well, all I can do is pray, and they always feel like it's sort of a cop-out, like it's, the, it's not powerful. But if you're really praying... And you know, one time the disciples tried to cast out a devil, Mark chapter 9, and they couldn't do it. They said, Lord, how come you could cast them out and we couldn't? And Jesus, this, he said, this kind does not come forth except by prayer and fasting. So you may even fast and pray for them. And you may do it more than once. And then third thing is be a good example. You can be a stretcher bearer and bring people to Jesus by doing those things. And then the fourth thing, I told you is three and a half. Do those things patiently and persistently. So once you figure out what it is you're doing, continue to be a good witness. If they're open, share information. If they don't want information, don't push them. You'll drive them away. I, I know some dear loving parents and they want to reach your kids and they just keep raining things on them and the kids feel like you're always preaching to me and it just drives them away. You got to know when to back off. It's hard, I know. And... And keep in mind, that man that is brought into the presence of Jesus is not brought into the presence of Jesus by one person. It's four people. So often when someone is saved, it's not the work of any one person. Even Paul said, one person might sow, another person reap, someone cultivates. It's like we all work together. I used to think I'd stop and pick up hitchhikers and I'd witness to them because that's one of the things that happened to me. You may have heard my testimony. I, I prayed and this Christian picked me up and he took me 2,000 miles and he talked about the Lord and the Bible the whole way and, and I just had to listen to him or jump out of the car. And so I always thought, that's a great idea. You got a captive audience. <laughs> so I'd pick up hitchhikers 
And uh, I, I pick them up at point A, and then I think, well, how far before they're getting off? And I think, I've got to do a gospel presentation. I've only got six miles. <laughs> and I, I always felt like I would maybe not pick them up if I didn't have long enough to do a gospel presentation. And the Lord, I'm sorry to tell you that. I admit it's true. Once I said, oh, you know, it's, I, I'm turning off just in two miles up here. I said, I, how much can I share in that time? And I drove by him. And one day the Lord convicted me. He said, Doug, what makes you think you're the only part of the gospel they're ever going to hear? <laughs> so maybe you could share a little bit. Maybe you just give them a ride because you're a Christian and they need a ride. They don't need you to preach to them. They need a ride. It's like some of us will give a person a track, but we won't give them bread when they're hungry, you know. <laughs> so uh, I realized, Lord, I don't have to do it all myself. And when I pray for people I love, I say, Lord, I pray you'll send people into their lives. Not just one person. Send people into their lives. That's yet four stretcher bears. You know, Jesus said he'll send his angels to the four corners of the earth. That's north, south, east, and west. It's a symbol for something universal. Four angels holding back the four winds of strife. It's talking about something universal. God is going to bring people from all different parts of their life, all corners, to reach them. So remember that. He has his ways. Be a good example. Share information and uh, pray for them and do those things persistently. So they said, we're not giving up. And then at that point, instead of looking horizontally, they said, we got to look above the crowd. That's our theme for this week. They finally decided, you know, we've been trying to go in through the door and through the window. Maybe we're not thinking about this right. Instead of looking this way, we got to look this way. Now, really, there's both involved in being a Christian. There's the horizontal and there's the vertical. Very simple. The gospel is horizontal and vertical. Great invitation, Matthew 11. Come unto me. This is the vertical relationship. Jesus says, come unto me and I'll give you rest. You come to Christ. Then you've got the horizontal, Matthew 28. Go and tell the whole world. What are the two commandments? Love the Lord as a vertical, love your neighbor as yourself. And so the whole gospel is summarized into coming to Jesus and going for Jesus. So they had done their best to do the horizontal, and one of them said, well, maybe we ought to look up. And so they took their friend around back. The crowd was a little thinner there. And just so you know, in the Bible land, especially down by the Sea of Galilee, Karen and I were there um, oh, about a year and a half ago, yeah, and uh, very hot down by Tiberius and Capernaum. And uh, the houses are built there so that, you know, they didn't have gas ranges or electric ranges. They had a fire. And in the summertime, they'd, or even in the winter, they had a little place in the roof that they'd open up. They'd pull aside some tiles and some of the covering, and the air would come in from the doors and the windows and the convection would cause it to naturally go out the chimney up and they used to build their homes back then where they actually would go out on the roof you remember Peter's up on the roof praying as he's waiting for dinner and uh, you read about um, Moses said you're to build a little railing on the roof of your house so when your friend's up there if he falls off you're not accountable for his blood to protect him and, um, and David was walking out on the roof of course he got in trouble for doing that so they would go up on the roof. It wasn't uncommon. There was a place on the roof. And so these guys thought, well, let's take them up on the roof and um, let's pull aside the tiles that they use for the chimney. And we'll just, if they're not going to let us in, we're not giving up. You know the story when Peter got out of prison, he went to the church. You know that story? Peter gets out of prison. He goes to the upper room where the church is praying for him. They're all up there praying for him. The Bible says they were praying for Peter without ceasing. And he knocks. And they won't open the door. And he keeps knocking. And finally a girl comes to the door. She said, who's there? Peter, I can't help you. We're having a prayer meeting for Peter right now. <laughs> I said, who's there? Peter, Peter, Peter. She runs and she tells them they're having a prayer meeting. She said, excuse me. No, no, we're praying. Lord, help your servant Peter. Please bring him, bring him out. Do something wonderful. And she said, Peter's at the door. You're crazy. That's what they said. Here you got the church praying for Peter to be delivered. And they said, Peter's at the door. 
And Peter's still out there. <laughs> Roman soldiers are swarming the streets looking for him. And it says, Peter continued knocking. Don't give up. If you go to the church in the crowd, I mean, even those disciples back in Peter's day that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit weren't even letting the church elder back in the church. Isn't that something? Here he's a preacher of Pentecost and they won't open the door for him. But Peter wouldn't be discouraged. If you've tried to bring people to the church and the church gets in the way, don't be discouraged. You know why? Jesus was in that house. In spite of the problems with the crowd, all through this story, the crowd is a problem. But Jesus was in the house. It's like a preacher once said, during the flood, probably one of the last places in the world you would want to be is in the ark. Can you imagine the seasickness that would be compounded by the smell of the animals and the awful sounds that were made? But it was better than being on the outside of the ark. And with all of its failings, with all of its flaws, the book Acts of the Apostles tells us, this is the E.G. White, her commentary on that, that in spite of its failures and flaws, the church is the object on earth upon which he bestows his supreme regard. It's the apple of his eye. And yes, the problem with the church is there are people in the church. And I know there are hypocrites in the church. And the crowd sometimes is an obstacle to Jesus. Don't let that keep you from coming because there are hypocrites. So as one pastor said, there's always room for one more. You should join anyway. <laughs> Someone says, you know, it's just so hard to come to the church. They don't seem very loving. Have you ever heard someone say, I don't go to that church. It doesn't seem very loving. That is the best church to go to because you need to learn to love. And if everyone's loving, you don't learn anything. It's like, if you want patience, don't pray for patience if, if you're an impatient person because God will send you delay. Isn't that right? Yes. And if you say, Lord, give me a loving heart, what do you think he's going to do? Surround you with loving people? If you say, Lord, give me a loving heart, you say, okay, brace for impact. <laughs> I'm going to send you people <laughs> that are going to stretch your love muscles. And you're going to find out what I see every day is what God says. <laughs> but God loves us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. So they go up on the roof and they start pulling the tiles aside. And, uh, and all of a sudden this light comes streaming through. Jesus is in there and he's surrounded by, you know, the people. He's got the apostles in there. They're all crowded in there with Peter and the other apostles and scribes and Pharisees, one of the best seats. They always sought out the chief seats, Jesus said. So they're all squashed around. There's probably some spies in there and people all craning their necks in the doors and the windows. They're listening to every word that he said. Some of them are sincere believers. Some of them are just curiosity seekers. Some of them go wherever there's a crowd. They get in line. They just, they follow the bandwagon wherever it goes. They don't even know why they're there. So he had all kinds. Churches sometimes have all those kinds too. So he's teaching. They start pulling inside the tiles and in the streams of sunlight, the dust starts to fall down. They hear the clutter and the clatter up on the roof and some of the religious leaders are thinking, oh man, these crude people in this town. You know, you come up here by Galilee and they just have no breeding. It's like, oh, it's like uh, oh, Thompsonville or something like that. It's just <laughs> country folks. That's really what they were thinking. I don't mean the Thompsonville part. I mean, the, the religious leaders, that's what they said. They're Galileans. What do they know? They thought that they were just so rude and so crude and they had an accent and they talked funny and, and, um, uh, are you going to forgive me, Danny, about the Thompsonville part? I, uh, I'm just kidding. They are just a joke, mostly. <laughs> now, does Jesus get upset? How many of you like to be interrupted when you're giving a Bible study? I mean, you know, right when you're getting ready to make your appeal. Some devil pinches a baby. <laughs> or the kids on the front row start passing their phones back and forth and snickering. They're not paying any attention. I get distracted. I want to know what they're laughing at because <laughs> I've got ADD. 
And so, you know, no one wants to be distracted in this sermon, but how does Jesus respond? When Jesus saw their faith, he was happy. They let him down on his bed, and he saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, wait a second. Why did Jesus start there? I would think that, you know, if he's known as a healer and this man who is obviously physically handicapped is lowered down into the presence of Jesus, that Jesus is going to say, oh, he's paralyzed. This, his problem is obvious. And he'd go right to the sickness. Why did Jesus start with the sin? Please always remember that every physical healing that Jesus ever performed was only temporary. Even Lazarus, who was resurrected, is now dead. You know that. <laughs> that the reason that Jesus healed physically is to show his love and better empower people to seek after the real priority, which is the spiritual healing. Now, I'm, I believe in the health message. And um, I think it's very important. But the most important thing, if I've got to choose... Uh, this person can have physical healing or they can have spiritual healing. Which healing is going to last forever? <laughs> and sometimes people come to us as pastors and they say, we'd like to have an anointing and we want to be healed. There's a physical problem and we believe in that. We've seen miracles. We really have physical healing, miracles. And um, but the first thing I say when I pray with them, I say, let's first talk about the sin. Because, you know, the Bible tells us in James chapter 5, and if he or she has committed sins, they'll be forgiven because that's the real issue. Jesus came to save us from our sins. What is the biggest contribution of Christianity in the world? If you ask the people in the world at large, what does Christianity do for the world? And some might say, well, you know, they, they teach good values and they, they teach morality and, and there, there's benefit in the health message. And, and, you know, people say all kinds of things about Christianity in general, but I'll tell you what the big thing is, is we are all perishing. We are going to die. The lost are going to be judged. They're going to go to the lake of fire and pay for their sins. The penalty for sin is death, and we are dying because of sin. The most important thing that Christianity does for the world is it offers, through Christ, forgiveness for sin. Amen. That's the priority. Because if your sins are forgiven, no matter what else might happen in your life with your circumstances, when you die, you have everlasting life in a world where there is no more physical suffering or problems or sorrow or pain or death. And so what could be more important than saying your sins are forgiven? Then when Jesus comes, you got your ticket. Everything else we pray for, it's so many people, they, it's like the guy in jail. And he says, Lord... This, this jail is miserable. No heating, no air. Will you please help, help us get some central heating and air in this jail? It is so hot in the summer and it's so cold in the winter. Lord, the bed is so hard. Could you please make the bed more comfortable? Lord, it is so loud with the prisoners. Be more quiet. And, and it's like a prisoner praying. Lord, can I have carpet for my prison cell? And the Lord is saying, why don't you ask that I get you out of jail? We typically pray that God will make us more comfortable in our prison. That's right. Our prayers are that God will bless us while we continue with a life of sin. That's not what He wants to do. He wants to save you from your sin because that's really the source of all our misery. And our ultimate deliverance from any physical or environmental problem will be forgiveness of sin. If your sins are forgiven, then you got everything. My grandfather used to say, if you've got your health, Dougie, you're a rich man. And I've come to believe that, uh, though that is very important, I say, if you've got your forgiveness, you are a rich man or a rich woman. If you know your sins are forgiven, then you've got eternal life. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there. They're reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They were right. That's what the scriptures teach. Only God could forgive sin. Now, they needed to make a decision. Was Jesus God or was he a blasphemer? 
To prove then that he was God, it says he reads the thoughts of their hearts. Immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit, they reasoned thus within themselves, who can forgive sins? Only God. Was Jesus God? The Bible says God and God only knows the thoughts of our hearts. John chapter 2 says Jesus knew what was in man. Jesus fills all of the definitions of God. In the beginning God created. The Bible says all things that were made were made by Christ. Is that right? Yeah. It says He is the Word. The Word became flesh. The Bible says there is one Savior. Well it says that Jesus was Savior. He's the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus must be God. The Bible says only God should be worshipped. When He rose from the dead, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And the other disciples fell down and worshipped Him. Even angels said, Don't worship me. Worship God. Jesus meets, meets the definitions and they said, Only God can forgive sin. He said, That's my point. Why do you reason these things? He's reading their hearts. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or, You guys want evidence that I'm God? What's easier? Say, Your sins be forgiven? Or say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Now that man, he was already happy. When he heard Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, uh, his face was just flushed with peace and with joy because that's the most important thing that he wanted. In the book Desire of Ages 268, now in words that fell like music on the sufferer's ear, the Savior said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. The burden of despair rolls from the sick man's soul. The peace of forgiveness rests upon his spirit and shines out on his countenance. His physical pain is gone. His whole being is transformed. The helpless paralytic is healed. The guilty sinner is pardoned. In simple faith, he accepts the words of Jesus as the boon of new life. He urged no further request, but he lays in blissful silence, too happy for words. He doesn't even know that he can get up and walk now. He says, my sins are forgiven. He's laying in there in blissful silence. The light of heaven irradiated his countenance and the people looked upon the scene with awe. Everyone saw something had happened to him. A peace comes over him. But now Jesus says, you don't think that I'm God? He says, the man, arise, take up your bed. And in obedience to the word, he gets up. And he probably is in shock himself. He rolls up his stretcher that bed that carried him around sick and now he carries it out and the Bible says they were all amazed they said they'd never seen anything like that before now, this is one of the most important points Jesus said to his friends when he saw their faith he didn't say his faith when he saw their faith this man is healed at least in part because of the faith and persistence of his friends that persisted to bring him into the presence of Christ amen. don't give up for your loved ones and friends all things are possible to, with God amen? amen the other important point is that man came to Christ carried by his bed you know all of us as humans we've got these two natures at war you got the spirit and the flesh. Read Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8. There's a war that goes on. Even after you're saved, you feel the war because you've got the spiritual desire, but you get the, the flesh, the selfishness, and all the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and we all have it. Before that man came to Jesus, he was a slave to the bed. He went where the bed took him. After he met Jesus, does he still have the bed? Yes. But who's carrying who? The Bible says when you're saved, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Amen. Sin no longer reigns. You still have that carnal nature, but now Christ is on the throne in your life, and you're not led by the flesh, you are led by the Spirit. Amen? How does that happen? We come into the presence of Christ, and we hear Him say, Son, you know what we call Him? Son, you're adopted. Your sins are forgiven. He accepts that by faith. And all of a sudden, a miracle takes place and he can walk in a new walk and a new life. That man went outside with the whole package. He's got the inner healing and he's got the outer healing. I'd like both too, don't you? You want both? Jesus, through the power of his word, he can do both for you. 
And as we close tonight, and for those here and those who may be watching, if you'd like to say, Lord, I want that experience. I want to be in your presence and be completely healed and forgiven. Praise God. We're going to pray as we close out the program and ask him.